The following program is a presentation of Disability Rights Nebraska and is made possible by funding from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Nebraska, the Woods Charitable Fund, and the Nebraska Planning Council on Developmental Disabilities. It's about a culture of schooling, at least in North America, that's never been about inclusion for all from its inception. We're thinking about an inclusive lifestyle throughout your life. We need to presume every student's competence and ability to benefit from inclusive education. Every single solitary student. What we need to do takes a lot of courage, but what happens is it's going to change our community and our world. Inclusion isn't a certain type of programmatic offering. Eventually, we'll just be calling it education. We have a long ways to go. Good life begins with a really wonderful and good education. If children start off life with full inclusion, chances are better that they will live a life of full inclusion, and we know that to be true. There is inclusive education happening in Nebraska, but it is the exception rather than the rule. We have sought to develop an institute, to create an institute, based on what we learned. And the first thing, our goal is to bring people together to end isolation. The other piece is that we have, we're providing you with a content-rich event. And you know, any one of these presenters would be a headliner for any one event on inclusive education. We brought together seven people. So that's, it's really, really impressive. What we're hoping today and tomorrow is that we will be able to achieve a critical mass in terms of uh, advocacy capacity here. On behalf of Disability Rights Nebraska, welcome today. It's a content-rich institute. So you're going to get a lot of information. We hope that you'll use that information. You're going to have opportunity to have conversations about how you might use that information. And then, as ambassadors, you have an opportunity to go back to your own communities, your own schools, and bring these ideas back and have conversations there and work again to develop inclusive educational programming and services within schools which leads to ultimately inclusive practices and services in the larger community. If we start with the premise of inclusive education at the beginning, the desired outcome of inclusive community life has a lot better chance of happening. Isn't it interesting that we have to work so hard to think about inclusive education? Isn't it interesting that we have to have, you know, all these conferences and do so much study and so much advocating, uh, working hard, coming together for inclusive education? Now, why is that? Why aren't our kids just, like, going to school? Kids with and without disabilities. Um, well, one of the reasons, and I think this might be the primary reason uh, that I would like all of us to consider, is that when you live with a disability or some other kind of condition that is seen in a negative way by society, um, you become devalued in the eyes of society. And so what do I mean by devalued? Am I saying that a person is not valuable or worthwhile? No, because I think all of us would agree that all human beings have inherent worth and value. What I'm saying is, that when you embody some kind of characteristic or quality that is seen or judged in a negative way by society, then you, in fact, get seen as less than, not quite as valuable as. 
not as worthwhile as. Second class, um, second class citizen, maybe not even a citizen. And I would propose to you that indeed uh, our students who live with disabilities and other kinds of conditions that are judged in a negative way in our society are thrust into a devalued social status. And once that happens to you, you are very vulnerable to other people's ideas about what you can and cannot do, where you can and cannot be, who you can and cannot be with, and so forth. So we have to remember, why are we here? We're here because we're representing people who have been marginalized and not just thought about in a negative way, it's more than that, thrust <coughs> into a socially devalued status. Now there are very significant consequences that come when that happens to you. Uh, Oftentimes, and I'm going to run through these very quickly, oftentimes your identity is reduced to that of your impairment or your disability. So my daughter uh, lives with Down syndrome. It's amazing how many times during her education that's what people saw. They, they had a hard time seeing past Down syndrome to seeing the whole person. And they made all kinds of assumptions about her, about what she could do, what she couldn't do, based on their ideas about people with Down syndrome. And as her parents, one of the things that we continually had to keep saying is, um, actually, Mary is more than her disability. It's part of her identity, but she's got a pretty big identity. That's hurtful when your identity gets reduced to that of you know, one aspect of who you are. Um, you get rejected, profoundly rejected. And of course, rejection is something that all of us can relate to. It's part of the human experience. But I would say, when you are thrust into a devalued status, you are vulnerable anyway to experiencing even more profound rejection than you would if you had uh, you know, a societally valued status. We know this. Um, that when you are devalued, you get segregated, okay, so that means put apart and away, and congregated, put together with, quote, people of your own kind, is how it's oftentimes referred to. I, so many times, you know, we've been challenged as a family, our daughter being fully included, we've been asked, um, are you sure you're doing the right thing? Doesn't she belong with her own kind? And my response, first time, you know, it kind of took me back, but my response uh, I learned over the years was to say, Mary's own kind. Oh, you mean people who like hip hop? Oh, you mean people who love theater? Right? So who would your own kind be? People that you have something in common with, right? But of course, when they were saying that to me, who did they mean? Other students with Down syndrome. Uh, I thought it would just be helpful to put some words around um, inclusion. And, uh, you know, because I think it's good that we keep talking about it, trying to understand it. Uh, it's not always readily apparent to everybody what it is. There are lots of perversions, of course, that are out there. So here are just some words, again, drawn from the work of Dr. Wolfensberger, which I think are helpful. Um, the idea of personal social integration. What do, I know we don't use the word integration much anymore. But what this means to me is person-to-person -person contact. That's the way I think about it. You know, between students with and without disabilities. Personal contact. Secondly, um, being in a rich environment of people. People that you can have all kinds of um, interactions with and make contacts with. And then from those interactions and contacts, you know, develop a variety of different kinds of relationships with typical, like a citizens with typical students there, uh, you know, members of the student body, and in typical shared activities, doing the, the things that all students are doing in school, um, and really being in the role of a student. So every year for Mary schooling, we'd say, okay, today, or this year, Mary is in grade 11. So she's in a grade 11 student. And this is what grade 11 students do. Um, and being in the 
typical physical and social settings. So uh, just uh, you know, put that out there for you. I think it's a it can be useful to sort of break it down and use those terms. And of course, we're thinking about uh, you know full, meaningful, inclusive life in all of the different life spheres. Some of which uh, you know the key ones you know I've listed here. Um, I think it's a very, very helpful thing to have some clear kinds of pieces of what does inclusive education mean in your mind, you know, as you are, are advocating. So, um, educating all students, and so Bruce and Cheryl will be talking about does all really mean all, which is a big controversy in inclusive education. Uh, but when it's really inclusive, it's all students uh, in age-appropriate general education classes. So being in classes that are age-appropriate for the student and being engaged in learning that is age-appropriate for the student. Lots of times you'll see um, kids in age-appropriate classes, but they're doing things that would be typical of peers who are much younger uh, younger than them. So, you know, a high school class that I recently visited, age appropriate, there's a 15 year old in a grade 10 class with an intellectual disability. That was age appropriate, but what was he doing? He was doing puzzles that were designed for about three and four year olds in the back of the classroom. So, educating all students in age appropriate general education classes um, in their neighborhood schools with high quality instruction. This is what we would hope for all of our students. Um, not that you would just be present and not really learning and um, you know, engaging with the rest of the class, which does include supports, um, accommodations, so that all students can be successful in the core curriculum. So it's not a special curriculum, it's the core curriculum that all of the students are studying. Inclusive schools have a collaborative and respectful school culture where students with disabilities are presumed to be competent, develop relationship with peers, and are participating members of the school community. So um, I would encourage you to take a little bit of time uh, with the different pieces of this definition, thinking about them, you know, you can read something and say, oh, yeah, 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 I know what that means. But I found myself uh, in positions where I'm being challenged about the idea of inclusive education, and I have to be able to speak to these using my words. Here's what I've heard. She'll never need that stuff. So um, how many of you took high school chemistry 100 years ago? How many of you remember the formula for converting grams to moles? and moles to grams. You don't? So even though you didn't learn, at least you didn't retain, all that information we still thought, or your teachers still thought, for some reason it was important for you to be in the room when that information was being taught, right? But we somehow, we don't look at students with disabilities as falling under that rule. He doesn't have the prerequisite skills, is one I hear an awful lot of the time. Um, he has an IQ of fill in whatever the, <laughs> fill in the blank with whatever number. Um, he's just too disabled. She'll be bored because it's over her head. Uh, he needs to learn life skills like um, how to cross the street safely three out of five times. Her developmental level is one month, 18 months, three months. From here on forward, um, we will challenge you to not ever use any of those phrases, to never talk about your own children's, quote, developmental level or, or, or IQ, because they have nothing to do with pretty much anything. <laughs> um, so, I'm one of those people that have been labeled or been accused of being an inclusionist. I'm an all means all person. Um, and I think that part of this idea of all means all is that we need to presume every student's competence 
and ability to benefit from inclusive education. Every single solitary student. And um, back when I was first doing my work, um, I would say this is in the late 80s, I remember doing a presentation for um, a group of faculty um, on inclusive education, which was really in its infancy, at least in New Hampshire at that time. And I started showing slides of kids. And when I showed this slide, someone raised her hand and she said, I really believe in, cl in inclusion, but you don't really mean students with Down syndrome, do you? Right? A little later on in my career, when people in New Hampshire had already um, agreed with this idea that, yes, yeah, students with Down syndrome could be included, they said, but you don't really mean Leslie. Leslie is a student who, um, because of her particular disability label, um, gets in her classmates' personal space um, too closely. And if her classmate happens to be eating something, Leslie will grab it and eat it. So people said, not Leslie. Um, this little girl, Miranda, has a disability called Angelman syndrome. Again, some years later, people were like, okay, I get the kids with Down syndrome. I get the kids, you know, who may have a medical issue, but we can figure that out. But you don't really mean kids with Angelman syndrome. They clearly are the, some of the most disabled kids in the world. Then people said, okay, I get that maybe all those kids with the strategies you've taught us, but not students like Marika. Marika doesn't walk, she doesn't talk, she needs assistance to move pretty much every part of her body. Then they even said, but you don't mean students like Charles, who uses his feet? Aren't the other kids going to be so grossed out by the fact that he does everything with his feet? He eats with his feet, he attaches the battery cables with his feet. You don't mean students like Stephanie, you don't mean students like Deshaun. So I think the point is that <clears throat> as long as we leave open the possibility that there are some students who we know cannot be included, then we're going to spend more of our time trying to figure out who those students are than we are going to spend on spend our energies on figuring out how to support that other group of kids. Um, and I think these kind of glass half empty assumptions about students' competence just lead to those debates going on and on and on about who should be included and who shouldn't. So to me, all means all is just gonna save us a lot of time, a lot of lawyers' fees, um, and um, a lot of parents' years and years of, of kind of fighting the same battles over and over again. One of the reasons that works for me, um, that helped me develop my value of all means all, is an idea that's called the least dangerous assumption. And I did not invent it. Um, a researcher named Ann Donnellan did back in 1984. And um, this least dangerous assumption idea says that we should use the least dangerous assumption of presuming students' competence as one of those core foundational beliefs on which we develop students' educational programs. Presuming competence is my least dangerous assumption. Here are the reasons for me why it is. Um, number one is that expectations matter. There's some really interesting research out there that looks at the influence of teacher expectations on student learning. It's really phenomenal that when teachers expect more, kids do better. I heard absolutely. A lot of this just isn't rocket science, is it? My second reason is that the traditional assessments that we give to people who have big labels um, are really flawed. <laughs> um, this whole thing called intellectual disability or mental retardation, I think, is something that we've made up. So these tests measure what people can't do rather than they, what, they, what, what they could do if they had the right supports. 
we have now a growing body of research, and every time I do this presentation, I add one more year, like 41 years of experience um, showing that people, children, adults, whom we've labeled, quote, retarded, can show that, in fact, they have a lot more competence than we ever thought when they're taught well and given a means to communicate. So here is the communication device that's often given to kids who have big labels. Um, and so I'm going to pretend I'm the sophomore and I'm in history class. I'm sure I'm in front of somebody. And the teacher says to me, who was the 16th president of the United States? So show me on your communication device. Goodbye. OK. No, it's OK. Try again. You want to take a break? Try again, I'm hungry. What does the student, what does the teacher conclude as a result of what I just, you do, I conclude she doesn't know. Does she have a way to show me? No. <laughs> so let's give kids, even before they can demonstrate that they are proficient communicators, if there's one thing I can get across, kids need access to the same kinds of vocabulary and messages as their typical classmates do. Before they demonstrate 100% mastery of stuff like this, because giving them a means of communication and supporting their communication is part of the way they learn to communicate and learn. My fourth reason for presuming competence is to presume incompetence could result in harm to our students. And then the fifth one is a bit of the, bit of the um, other side of the same coin. Even if we're wrong about students' capacities to learn gen ed curriculum content, the consequences to students of that incorrect presumption are not as dangerous as the alternative. So I just leave you to think about um, for these next couple of days, and as, as you go forward with your own children and others, is what is your least dangerous assumption? What I wanted to do in terms of talking about all means all, and it doesn't mean all children either. It means all, all people, if you want, in literally almost every sphere of life. So it's across the lifespan, across all dimensions of life, and it's across all individuals with disabilities. But I've picked... Um, this uh, little piece of uh, work, and I'm going back in a sense 30 years ago, just as a way of illustrating that, you know, these are decades of work that <coughs> we've been struggling with, and just that what <coughs> I was engaged with that time was a number of families. I'd been doing inclusive education and lots of other things around kids in early childhood settings, which went relatively well. But then the transition to grade one seemed to be like a transition to another world, actually, in terms of the resistance that we found. And so there were families who were trying to create change. They wanted their kids out of segregated schools. They wanted them in regular schools. When they were in regular schools, they wanted them out of special classes with some time with their peers and so forth. And partly it's because the way they saw the world was that the outcomes of special education or education at that time was in fact day programs and sheltered workshops. Right? And so people end up with still really, you know, phenomenal rates of unemployment, of poverty, of impoverished lives, of lack of friends in their lives, lack of natural supports, uh, and um, often dependent on uh, paid supports which change at a phenomenal and great rate depending on what funding is available. <clears throat> and so this wasn't in fact in their interest in trying to create a good life for their sons and daughters. This was not the outcomes that they were, in fact, um, uh, hoping for. And so we wanted to try to figure out then what would be a way of trying to alter things dramatically. So incremental change was taking a phenomenal long time, particularly with schools. And you will hear me be critical at times of schooling and the culture of schooling. So in a way, in my own defense, I am married to a school superintendent. So it makes for interesting dinner conversations, <laughs> um, actually, in terms of our different, uh, uh, different roles. And I have a daughter-in-law who's a teacher. So I also understand something from the other side, so to speak, if we consider it as sides at times. And that um, we wanted an effect, to, an effect to see what would happen if we challenged ourselves. And one of the propositions we hold is that we are, in fact, and therefore people with disabilities, limited by our imaginations. So we'd like to think our imaginations are 
unlimited, that they're expansive, that they know no, no limits, but that in fact has not been our reality. And it's both true for families and those who are uh, uh, advocates that we unconsciously in fact limit the possibilities for people with uh, different uh, uh, disabilities. And so what we decided to do was that these were parents I was working with who were on the cusp of finishing uh, high school and um, wanted to see something different. So one of the processes we use is something called uh, normative pathways. And I will over the two days explain that to a greater degree, but most of you, I don't know all your individual stories of course, most of you would actually be on a normative pathway and would have been since you were born or beforehand. That is, your parents were already thinking of you in terms of what your life would look like and how you would follow that pathway over time. And even though you've all been on normative pathways, you're all unique, individual, and have many of you would have had unexpected life outcomes. So how many of you, for example, are working in the field in which you actually thought you would be doing when you were in high school? A few, but not too many, right? So what we want is a life of unexpected possibilities, as is true for us those of us without disabilities. <clears throat> so we wanted to challenge the, um, uh, these notions and what we decided to do was to see what was a normative pathway, at least for some individuals who were leaving high school with significant intellectual disabilities and that is people without disabilities would often go on, not all, to post-secondary education or training. They need time to mature, to grow, to develop memories, I think Leslie said it earlier, right, to have the things you look back on your college and university, Right? The things you haven't yet shared with your parents or your spouses, <laughs> for example. Those are the memories that you hold. Um, there's high expectations for learning in post-secondary education, at least we'd like to think so. You have valued identities and roles, at least in our culture. You meet an amazing number of people to have m multiple opportunities for relationships. There's lots of choices. I mean, look at the difference between what a, um, a college or university has to offer when you're looking at their calendar, for example, of courses, programs of studies, faculties, etc., and then compare that to the options typically laid out in front of somebody with an intellectual disability. There is, in fact, no comparison, relatively uh, speaking. We all want to be engaged in typically lifelong learning. So the question was, if we were going to include people in places that we hadn't yet seen them included, you know, who should we begin with? So our idea was to try to include people in university, in very elite academic institutions which prided themselves on the fact that you had to compete to get in, only so many of you could get in, there were limited spaces, and if you're lucky to get in, you in fact might end up with a better life than might be true otherwise. So these were places, if you want, where people were not thinking at that time <clears throat> Today in Alberta alone, we have 20 of our 26 publicly funded post-secondary institutions have inclusive post-secondary education for people with significant intellectual disabilities, more proportionately than anywhere else in the world. So if we can do it in Alberta, it's probably possible in Nebraska, because you don't get frozen here the way we do, <laughs> right, typically. So who should we start with? The typical ideology or thought of the time was, well, you start with those most likely to be successful, because you want to establish the validity of your effort. And then after you've done that, because you're at, you know, at risk. In fact, to be honest, even though I had the relationships to allow this to begin with universities, most people thought we were out of our minds. This is never going to work. And so you'd want to start with those you might have the best chance of success at. And then, of course, <coughs> those with more significant, multiple, the most severe disabilities, they would have an opportunity to then be included afterwards. I'd never seen that happen yet. They always waited. They're always on the margins, right? So we decided that we would start by including those, not exclusively, but as part of the numbers of students we began with, young people we began with, to include those, and here's where we get into that dilemma of what does it mean to have the most severe disability, right? And so um, that's, I'm going to talk about that a little bit just to try to illustrate it. And we also thought if we included those individuals we thought of as most challenging, okay, those would be difficult to understand what life could look like in university, we would learn far more about facilitating inclusion than we would ever learn, in fact, by including those individuals who challenged us less. And so that's how we um, began. And I, I won't have time to really do this much today, actually, but in a sense, 
inclusive post-secondary education, where there are in fact no laws requiring this in Canada. You have to do it all through relationships, if you want, and through convincing people of the merits of this particular, um, uh, particular approach, really follows very comparable to inclusive education from K to 12 as it was just described. So you have to understand everybody is an individual. There's no congregation, no segregation, no grouping. Just like when you went to university and college, for those of you that did, you chose typically individually where you might go. You might have had a friend going to the same university and college and gone with them, but you typically pursued your own course of study. So in there are exactly the same faculties, programs, courses as anyone else. And in that context, whatever that curriculum is, it has to be modified and adapted along with the instruction to accommodate a student with intellectual disabilities. And in effect, these are universities and colleges where there would be limited seats in a lab. There are only so many microscopes to go around. And that means, <coughs> in terms of equity, <coughs> some seats have to be set aside for students who can't ordinarily, or not ordinarily compete. Otherwise, they never have the opportunity to be included in university or college. What's been most striking, one of the things I should say that's been most striking about this is the lack of resistance in post-secondary ed education for us to have students accommodated. It's as if, again, we're stepping into another world. In fact, in our, where we live, if you want, just a little bit north of you now, um, <coughs> inclusive schooling is probably the most difficult place we've tried to achieve inclusion. We've done better in inclusive employment, better in inclusive recreation and leisure and cultural activities, et cetera, and so on. But schools remain, in fact, one of the most challenging environments we have uh, in our uh, context. These are just, I just interspersed them with shots of people because I thought they'd be a more, lot more interesting than just reading, reading this. <coughs> this is Joanne. Uh, I have no idea where the dog is, but Joanne initially grew up on a farm till about the age of six, a large family. Uh, this would have been in the 50s or so, and um, she couldn't, uh, the family couldn't accommodate her, and so she would lived in multiple institutions. Uh, she went in, in a sense, uh, being able to talk and to walk, um, but when I met her, she was in her early 30s. Um, she was in an institution in our community where she actually had been in bed for three years. Uh, she uh, basically would be washed once, I think twice a week. She had a radio on in her room that would have music uh, playing and her family would visit her, uh, visit her there and so she's had no education throughout the entirety of her life. And at this point in time she has no ordinary means of communication. In fact she has very significant physical um, disabilities and we thought, gee, Joanne would be a good candidate to be included in university. <laughs> we had to go and find people. There were not people saying and thinking, gee, why isn't she in university? for example. So we had to go and find people to do that. This is just Joanne again. Now, <laughs> Joanne, this is a horse. I don't know if you can see it licking her. You can't see it very well. Um, I live in a cowboy uh, province, right? We have the uh, Stampede in Calgary. Uh, just a little tourism boost for Alberta. Right? <laughs> and so it's a pull yourself up by the bootstraps kind of province, etc. And so we have uh, equestrian centers in our communities, actually. So riding if you want and roping and all those other things that go along being a cowboy, which I am not, which I think is fairly obvious, is ordinary. So with Joanne, <clears throat> we had to figure out then what would life, what would life look like for her? Ten minutes, okay. And basically because she had literally no life to speak of, we're grasping at straws, if you want, at threads, trying to weave it back together again. And Joanne had grown up on a family. What we knew at least is that she enjoyed being outside with her mom, she enjoyed the farm, etc. There was an equestrian center in, um, associated with the university. It's amazing what universities will consider post-secondary education, you know, like all kinds of sports activities, for example. Doesn't ring as humor here. It does to me, actually, because I'm not particularly athletic. And so uh, we involved Joanne in the uh, riding program, in the equestrian program. Probably riding is not the academic term they would use, you know, and, and so on. And she. <laughs> in a sense had this affinity for horses, as did, as, did, as did these other young people. And they could share that. They could see that. She couldn't tell them that. Right? She couldn't do very little, much for herself. But in fact, when she was around them, she would light up. She'd pick up her head, for example. In order to be able to brush down the horses, there were staff here associated with her and supporting her, but we made sure our staff never know what to do, actually. <laughs> <laughs> 
And the reason is, then they need the people who know what to do, actually, to assist Joanne. And in some ways, you almost have to be engaged physically with Joanne to then be able to sit down and have coffee and have a conversation about what your days look like. Because if you haven't had that engagement, if you haven't had that relationship, it's hard, in fact, just to have a conversation with her. So when they would, I don't know the technical term, it's not walk around the ring, there's something for it, or with the horses and so on. Joanne loved to hold on to straps. She really liked purses, by the way, which was really an unusual characteristic for a wo young woman, I thought. <laughs> and so she would, hold on to the, she would hold on to the reins of the horse quite tightly, right? Someone would have to push her chair. And she'd walk with everybody else, and they'd be laughing and talking. And the horse would nuzzle her to get at the apple that's on the tray on her chair. Somebody would help feed the horse, and the horse would tickle her. Jo had it, Joanne had an infectious laugh, and you'd watch them walking around, and you'd literally see her disability all those years, decades, drop away. And as a result, she's had a fairly enriched, I won't go back, a fairly enriched life. She's had a pretty inclusive life. She lives in her own home. <coughs> she's involved in women's activities. She teaches children to read. I was going to use this later, now I've stopped myself up. How would she teach children to read? Some of you who are teachers. What do, kids, what do young kids need when they're trying to read? Practice. Somebody Practice. Listen. Somebody to listen and listen non-judgmentally, right? Somebody that's really interested in what they have to say, enjoys hearing them, and so on. We've interviewed dozens and dozens of faculty. And uh, almost literally every one of them, without prompting, will talk about how much more they gain from the experience of accommodating a student with dis intellectual disabilities or significant disabilities in their classroom than they thought they ever gave. So will their peers share that over and over again. Our continuing talk about, as we all do, that inclusion is about the benefit to students with disabilities is in fact incorrect. Because all of us stand to engage, and, uh, sorry, all of us stand to, uh, if you want, benefit from their, uh, uh, for their inclusion. And so what I wanted to try to say is, while we're focused on how to include all kids in regular education, there are many places in our communities today, in fact, where we're including people with the most significant challenges, actually. I'll just tell you one more quickly. In places in life where people have yet still to imagine. And so the odds are, when I do this, that many of you have not imagined people with intellectual disabilities being your classmates in university and college, or what you could learn from that experience and the benefits you would derive from it. And so that makes us, in some ways, even in our advocacy, part of the problem, which needs to be altered in order to become a greater part of the solution. What laws do you know apply to students with disabilities in school? Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, IDEA, what else? The ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, Section 504, the Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which we call Section 504. But it's good to know it's the Rehab Act. What else? In Nebraska, it'd be Rule 51 or Rule 52. Okay, in Nebraska, it's Rule 51 or Rule 52, because states have also promulgated their own rules with the federal rules as the floor. Y'all heard of FERPA? Oh, yes, you have. Um, Family Educational Rights and Privacy Act. Have you heard of HIPAA? Yeah. Have you ever heard of some rule about HIPAA and you're like, oh, wow, that's way too broad. That really couldn't mean that. People use FERPA the same way. It's like a privacy rule that can be used really as a block. But in some ways, privacy can be important. So that's another law. There's another newer law um, that we're not going to talk much about today, but I'll just plant a seed called um, WIOA, which is a workforce act. The other thing to know is there are a lot of different laws to think about, and there's also the Constitution, which is another, um, I mean, it's, it's easy to snicker. I know, I didn't mean to sound flippant, but, but, but truthfully, I think sometimes we forget that the students who live in this you know, very devalued status in schools still have all the same rights that other students have. So I think one mistake advocates often make is only looking to special laws and special protections versus looking at the range of laws that are available and rights. Inclusion, this is the only way we have a definition of inclusion. And, um, I would encourage you to use the measurements of inclusion that we've been talking about, not this 40, 80 percent thing, th reporting thing, and not a real thing. It doesn't mean anything for kids. So let's talk about the Americans with Disabilities Act. Have you heard about this act? Most people kind of think of this in their head as the RAMP Act. Right? 
they think about it as having just great potency around physical accessibility, and it did, sometimes. So you look at this room. But it did, it had a lot of, um, and it still does have a lot to do with physical access. And then over time, I don't know if you've heard of the integration mandate or the Olmstead case. Anybody heard of that? Um, it's a famous Georgia case that um, is about the Americans with Disabilities Act. And it said that not only do, and I'm you know, really paraphrasing, not only do places have to be physically accessible, but places have to also be programmatically accessible. And not only do people with disabilities have the right to access goods and <coughs> programs that are state and federally funded or that are open to the public, but those services need to be available in community-based settings. And that's called the integration mandate. So if you're writing a couple words down today, take the integration mandate. A lot of people call it Olmstead. I, I, that really, and I don't. I, I really hate when people do that because that's the case that kind of explained it. But it's really the Americans with Disabilities Act. And so we have a problem in Georgia where people are like, "Well, Olmstead says blah blah blah." Like, well, Olmstead was an official in Georgia. He really did not say that, <laughs> right? So think of. So keep this integration mandate in mind. This is going to be really important as we're talking about um, advocacy and legal advocacy and inclusion. And so what we've been thinking about in the education world is how does the ADA apply to schools? And why are we not applying the ADA to schools? So we're going to talk about, so you all are real familiar with IDA, right? Raise your hand if you know what FAPE means, if you're playing trivia and you would get it. FAPE. Okay. Free and appropriate public education. Have you heard of that? Have you heard of LRE? Yep. Least restrictive environment. Least restrictive environment, LRE, FAPE placement, these are all terms around IDEA. And let me tell you, the individualized nature, even though it was thoughtful as the law was created, has really created enormous physical and social distancing. You know when you go to an IEP meeting and people start talking about the um, continuum of placements, have y'all heard that language? Look, I love that nod, thank you. The continuum placements, are they talking about inclusion? No, they're talking about restriction. IDEA, because of the individualized nature, can be very um, pushing towards segregation. And we see it from the statistics that Cheryl spoke about. And even with great efforts by administration and by teachers and by state school superintendents and policymakers and university people, we've had a lot of trouble envi envisioning and implementing the promises of inclusive education solely with the use of IDEA. The Americans with Disabilities Act really talks about how we're structuring and setting up services. That was the hospital example earlier. And so the way many schools in Georgia are set up is that certain services are only available in certain places. And we're using the ADA to leverage the idea and to push schools to have more services available in neighborhood schools. And I have good relationships, actually, with a lot of education people in Georgia. And folks are really thrilled about it. Building level, administrator, building level administrators and teachers and superintendents want more control over how to use their funding in creative ways. And as I mentioned earlier, Georgia's funding systems have not changed since 1984 which really gives teachers and administrators very little discretion and leeway about how to use funds. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the state of Georgia had a letter of finding that they violated the entire state, the Americans with Disabilities Act, the way they're providing services to kids, especially with emotional behavior disorders. So the Americans with Disabilities Act has a, one big prong, it's called equal opportunity that everybody should get equal opportunity to have a level of achievement in all public programs, including all educational programs. And so the other thing, the ADA can be really powerful, is I talked yesterday about field trips and about extracurricular activities and about maybe if you went to, um, even if you were deaf and you went to a school play and you wanted to have an interpreter so you can understand what was going on in the play, or let's say you weren't you had your own disabilities and you had trouble writing and participating 
in a certain processes in schools. The Americans with Disabilities Act is broad enough in the civil rights sense that would help you, that you should have the same access as all the other parents and as if you were a student of all the other students to what's happening in these schools. So this is a really broad civil rights act, whereas IDEA is a you know, very specific um, kind of programmatic. And truthfully, if you really want to dig into IDEA, everybody would agree on the legal side, it's a process law. It's about dotting your I's and crossing your T's, the substance of the law. Now, I think we can use that, and that can really help students. You know, I've seen really beautifully substantively written IEPs that have not always been implemented well. I have seen really poorly written IEPs where kids have an incredible education. But from a safeguard sense, you'd want to see a strong plan because that would help you hopefully implement a strong program. So we talked a little bit about the least restrictive environment, which is the legal mandate of IDEA. So the two terms I'd like you to keep in mind. One is LRE, the least restrictive environment, which is the legal mandate around placement. Students should be, in, students should be educated in the least restrictive environment possible with their non-disabled peers. And so our Supreme Court has said that perpetuating unwarranted assumptions that persons so isolated are incapable, unworthy of participating in community life. And those assumptions were written about people who were in institutions, but now are being broadened to people with disabilities who are receiving services that are um, in other locations, like schools. I want to give you a couple um, advocacy pointers. Some people asked some questions yesterday. I thought that might be helpful according to the law. Um, when you are working with advocacy, and I put this observe a full day at school, and then read records if you are helping another family or working with other people. It's, I think it's really important to get to know kids interpersonally and who they are and what they're like before you look at a written documentation of students. Um, another big tool in FAPE is FAPE is based on the grade level standards. They may need to be accommodated they may need accommodation or modification of grade level standards for different students and their needs, but that's what it should be based on. I'm not sure what's happening in Nebraska, but in Georgia, the grade level standards are changing so fast. You know, it's, it's hard to even keep up with what they are to know how to write them. But it is a good um, basis, and you know, we teach advocates to oftentimes print those out and bring them to the meetings so people can look at them and to be you know, helpful and proactive in thinking about what the grade level standards are. Because especially if teachers have experienced the same kind of segregation and isolation as the students you're standing beside, they may not know what the grade level standards are because of the way we're structured. These are some kind of scripting and framing we sometimes use to work with school districts. And I often find that schools are thrilled to have advocates come in because then people get access to different materials or different experts or new types of instruction, new types of research. And te teachers are typically thrilled to have more resources come to the table. And they can't necessarily always get it on their own. Um, that's really funny though. P please share the peer, which please share the peer reviewed research to demonstrate segregation in congregation of students with behavioral challenges <laughs> improves their outcome. I haven't been able to find that. But we have been, that is powerful, I think, to talk about what we know. Um, high expectations. So if you're helping people write IEP goals one year at a time, people should be making a year of progress in a year's time. Um, and that the LRE, the presumption of the LRE, when you're thinking about individual students, should be the general education classroom. And we have to operate from that. What I'm really particularly excited about, and I think it will make advocates from every area in this world, is that as we're continually applying the Americans with Disabilities Act to the system, that it will be um, hopefully easier to access good things in neighborhood schools and across um, placements and more children will have access to those things and more teachers will also have greater capacity. Uh, and I think that that really is going to increase our inclusion rates by the structure being in compliance with the Americans with Disabilities Act. Does that make sense? It's a big teaching point. A universal design for learning is a way of designing instruction from the ground up that naturally includes all students.
And I'm going to, in a little bit, distinguish and sort of draw a difference between how universal design for learning works for students with disabilities versus what accommodations and modifications are. So hang in there with me. This is the formal definition. In terms of learning, universal design means the design of instructional materials and activities that makes the learning goals achievable by individuals with wide differences in their abilities to see, hear, speak, move, read, write, understand English, attend, organize, engage, and remember. Universal design for learning is achieved by means of flexible curricular materials and activities that provide alternatives for students, and there's that choice. These alternatives are built into the instructional design. They're not add-ons. Um, these are the three principles of universal design in more of a graphic representation. Multiple means of representation, multiple means of engagement. I get to choose group work. I get to choose my topic. I get to decide if I work best sitting in the hallway. And multiple means of action and showing you what I know. I'm now going to sort of compare and contrast for you sort of the traditional way we look at kids with disabilities fitting into instruction versus a universal design for way about thinking about instruction encompassing all kids. If the big blue circle is instruction, you're going to have to use your imaginations. And the amount of instruction or the, or the thought that the teacher was able to put into it around the universal nature of instruction was pretty small, then what are the special ed people going to have to spend a lot of time on? Accommodations and modifications. Because if the teacher hasn't already provided, um, you know, the article on the first spaceship in multiple reading levels, just as a matter of providing it for all kids, then the special ed teacher is going to have to scramble to do that. When all instruction is universally designed, and I have some debates with some of my colleagues about this, I say that the amount of effort and time and change and for, that you'll have to do for students with disabilities is very tiny. I have some colleagues that say when we get better at universal design, it'll just all work for all kids. Maybe what I'm thinking about is that little bit of leftover piece for kids maybe who have mobility disabilities, but I could be wrong. <laughs> um, so UD, UDL in a, in a nutshell, teachers vary their instructional formats frequently. Large group, small group, individual work, sitting, standing, walking, they provide different sort of grouping options for kids to work <laughs> together. They make materials accessible, starting with all materials existing in digital format. Because the the, we should be past the era where teachers hand out pieces of paper and, are not, and don't have those pieces of paper in a digital format that can be manipulated given students vision, reading, um, attention, and so on. Providing captions for audio, providing uh, audio descriptions for images and graphical layouts, providing captions, providing cognitive supports or scaffolding for students who come to the table perhaps with less background knowledge than other kids. By summarizing big ideas, um, teaching explicit reading comprehension strategies and so on, helping kids build fluency, and then providing kids with multiple ways to show what they know. Not quick and easy work for teachers. Teachers need the support they need supports in order for them to use the principles of universal design. Um, and so those supports need to come from the administrators to the teachers, or the school board to the administrators to the teachers to the kids. Okay, thanks. One of the things that we have been doing 
as, as professional development within um, when it, we're thinking about inclusive schools is it's really not about special education. The issue really becomes about, comes to what are we doing in general education? How are our classrooms set up so that we can differentiate the instruction for our students? Because what happens is trying to keep everything the same, because it's easier for us sometimes as teachers, but to really think about how can I, as a teacher, differentiate the instruction and work on with the multiple levels? Because even if I were to take all of the students that we label as a student with a disability, I'm still going to need to differentiate because every other student is not exactly the same. Our job here as a district is that we value children. We don't value certain children, but we value children. So how can I help you? How can I support you so that you can value the children in your classroom so that I'm really teaching children and I'm not teaching someone with a disability or someone who's gifted um, or someone who's, because we label. So it's almost like we have to get rid of the labels and just teach the children. So professional development is um, very important to me and, um, and, and to our teachers. And I think as, um, as I work with teachers, the biggest thing to overcome is fear. And once they know that they can take the risk, and I always tell them, we're never going to just come up with this little package and say, now we've figured it out. Every year, every child, every classroom, every day, we're gonna have to start over. So what happens with a student who is a discipline issue, or we look at he's a troubled student, or he's always active, or he's this, or all the things that we do is, the strategy I use today may not work tomorrow. The strategy I use for oh, three weeks may not work in a month. So, I'm, so when I think about it differently, and I realize that it's just something that I'm just going to not give up, and I'm just gonna keep coming up with different ideas, and they'll work for some children and not always others, and sometimes it'll work and sometimes it won't. When I think about it differently, then I'm not frustrated. But when I'm trying to make it perfect, and make it just the, if I just do A, B, and C, then my, my life's gonna be easier, and sometimes we just have to take a look at it different because we're dealing with different people. Just a little bit about the research. You know, one of the longest research uh, longitudinal studies done by Baker, Wong, and Wahlberg, um, special students um, in regular classes do better academically and socially than their comparable students in non-inclusive settings. And it's not new. 30 years of research has lined up to show that inclusion is good, not just for students with disabilities, but for all students. And, and of course, my favorite is why it's good for schools is it's, it's a civil rights issue. That's what we said we would do is educate children. And that's probably the most important to me. Um, location, 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 and general education is the prime real estate, at least in, in my mind. For yesterday and today, we've heard a lot of really relevant information in terms of uh, you know, getting a clear image as to what inclusion is about. Getting some really good clarity in terms of what advocacy is about. And I think we're, and some models as well, that other states use, have used. So I think we're at a threshold point here. So what we're going to be doing during the course of the next year is bringing together I guess what we could call a core group of people, and we're going to look to you, or at least some of you, to be part of that core group as we think about what kind of a model we're going to use, because we've got some examples here, and how are we going to implement that model. So we will have, starting uh, October 1st of 2017, we will have another five-year period during which we can engage in the development of the model, the implementation of the model, and figuring out how to sustain <laughs> the model over time. You've been equipped over the last two days with materials, information and material that you can spend thinking about, but there are certainly things that we can do to keep the flame going. Yeah. Yeah.
get that standing ovation. The preceding program is a presentation of Disability Rights Nebraska and is made possible by funding from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Nebraska, the Woods Charitable Fund, and the Nebraska Planning Council on Developmental Disabilities.